So welcome to the IRDL Scholars Speaker Series. The series is coordinated by a working group of librarian researchers who participated in a professional continuing education program called the Institute for Research Design in Librarianship. We welcome you today from the William H. Hannon Library at Loyola Marymount University, the home of IRDL. My name is Marie Kennedy. I'm the Serials and Electronic Resources Librarian and the co-director of IRDL. Welcoming you also is Christine Branglini, co-director of IRDL and Dean of our library. So this series is designed to shine a spotlight on voices and ideas that challenge traditional ways of conducting research. It examines specific research methods and critiques of processes associated with Western social science approaches with the intention of inspiring research explicitly rooted in social justice. As librarians, educators, and researchers, we welcome this opportunity to reflect and incorporate what we learn from today's speaker into our own research efforts so that our methodologies integrate anti-racist and anti-colonial practices. We look forward to thinking critically about research and power with you at today's session with Emily Ford. Moderating the session with me today is Catherine Baird. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Marie. Um, I'm excited to be helping out with moderation today. So my name is Catherine Baird and I'm the online and outreach librarian um, in Montclair, uh, New Jersey at Montclair State University in Northern New Jersey. So I'm gonna start today um, by acknowledging that I'm currently an inhabitant on the land in Lenape Hawking, traditional land of the Lenape. I recognize and support the sovereignty of New Jersey's three state recognized tribes, the Ramapo Lenape, the Nanakoke Lenni Lenape, and the Powhatan Lenape Nations. I also want to recognize the sovereign nations of Lenape elsewhere in North America, as well as other Indigenous individuals and communities now residing in New Jersey. So I wanted to let you know that we're recording this session today, and it will be made publicly available on LMU Library's YouTube channel uh, very soon. We'll also be using the live transcription provided by Zoom today. And an important thing to point out is that both the Q&A and the chat have been enabled for today's session. We ask you to please use the Q&A to direct questions to the speaker uh, and to use the chat for commenting and sharing your thoughts with the group. So we want this to be an uplifting and positive discussion. It's a professional event and we won't be tolerating any disrespectful comments in this session. We'll reserve the right to remove anyone from today's session if we observe anything that doesn't honor our speaker or our fellow attendees. So the plan for today's event, everybody, we're really excited. Um, here's how it's gonna go. Emily is gonna give a brief introduction about the storying process. And next she will guide us through the steps of the process with a transcript and audio available for you to work with as she moves us through those steps. Um, Marie, I think is gonna drop a link to a Google Drive folder in the chat here with some of those materials. Uh, and finally, you're gonna be able to participate actively uh, both in the chat and engage in the process and discussion. Uh, so thank you, Marie, I see that you've dropped the link there. And we'll definitely have time for questions and answers at the end. So as part of Loyola Marymount University's recognition of our history, location, and relationship to the indigenous communities in Los Angeles, we acknowledge the Tongva peoples as the traditional land care caretakers of Tovangar and the presence of LMU on our traditional, ancestral, and unceded land. We're grateful to have the opportunity to live, study, create, and be with you in this place. So we recognize the limitations of a land acknowledgement statement and would like to engage more personally by researching the different lands we currently inhabit. Please make use of the URLs, which we'll post in the chat for you to explore. We also encourage you to consider these two questions. What does a land acknowledge mean me personally? And how am I dismantling settler, settler colonial structures beyond this land acknowledgement? 
Thank you for your attention. Catherine will now introduce you to our workshop guide for the day. Great, thank you, Marie. Uh, sorry, just one second. All right. All right, so we're really excited today to welcome Emily Ford um, as our speaker. Emily is an associate professor and an urban and public affairs librarian at Portland State University Library in Portland, Oregon. She loves stories. She's curious to understand what makes people tick and how we can connect in community via lived experience. Although her research is focused on opening scholarly peer review, she she views the peer review system as one comprised of human experience stories. Her book, Stories of Open, Opening Peer Review Through Narrative Inquiry, was published in July 2021 by ACRL, ACRL Press. And when not immersed in stories, she is most likely found trail running, practicing yoga, or petting her cats and her pet rats. Maybe we'll get a glimpse of some of those friends here today. Um, Emily, Ford, Emily Ford's talk today is titled Storycraft, Developing Interpretive Narratives Using Storying Stories. So please uh, join me in welcoming Emily. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, just give me a second to share my slides. Um, oh, thanks for the applause. I see that in the chat. Okay, ookily dookily. Here we go. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> so I'm very, very happy to be here today. Thank you for having me back. It's such an honor to be invited. Um, and I know it takes a lot of work to organize these things and facilitate them. So thank you for all of your hard work. Catherine, Marie, Carol, Chris, um, everyone at LMU, uh, IRDL. Okay, so um, you can tweet me or find me at uh, my project on Facebook, or you can email me, it's on your, um, on, the, on the screen there. Uh, I'm really bad at Twitter, so my sister, tweeted at me like six to nine days ago and I just saw it today. So have some patience um, with that. So I'm gonna dive in, but before I do, I would like to share my own uh, land acknowledgement from where I sit here in uh, Portland, Oregon and a little bit about my worldview. Um, I sit on the traditional homelands of the Multnomah, Kithlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kaliapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. <clears throat> I acknowledge that I am here today because of the many sacrifices forced upon, forced upon these peoples and their ancestors. By recognizing these communities, we center our work and honor the first peoples of this region. And um, you have this beautiful image of the Columbia River Gorge here. I am an able-bodied, uh, neurotypical, white, cisgendered, heterosexual woman I call my myself an atheist Jew. I'm an intersectional feminist. I believe that knowledge is never concrete, constantly shifting, and that it cannot be separated from our physical and psychic experiences. And you might wonder why I share that about myself, but I think it actually um, points to the method that we're gonna be uh, trying to dive into today because um, in this type of method, you bring yourself as a human being and your lived experiences to the research and in the collaboration with the folks that you're um, researching with. So that is, is part of my lens and part of what influences how I uh, interpret um, the world and my research. So for today um, on the agenda, it's a pretty short agenda, but a lot of slides. Um, it, this is a follow-up from a presentation that I gave in February with IRDL, where it talked more about the theory of narrative inquiry. Um, and if you find the, the slides, there is a link to that presentation in the slides. Um, and a lot of the hands-on is, is a little harder to do over Zoom. We uh, debated breakout rooms, but, but just decided with the time given it wasn't going to work. Um, that being said, my sincere hope is that um, the chat is very lively and that you participate a lot in the chat um, to um, talk amongst one another to kind of bounce ideas back and forth. Um, <clears throat> my hope also is to, if, if I'm going over, I'm going to stop because I want to 
for there to be plenty of time for questions and a discussion set. Um, section. So I do plan to to stop um, 20 to 15 minutes um, before the end of our time at 1.30 Pacific. Um, not stop, that's when we're done done, but 20 to, to 15 minutes. Um, uh, yeah, so let's go on to uh, logistics. I want you to um, also consider just ignoring me during this time and <laughs> spending the time to go through the um, materials that are shared with you. Um, and I want to point out as well um, some of the documents, uh, they are linked, but you'll notice that the first three were kind of like the pre-work, and then um, in the resources section is where you will find a link to the analysis process, um, the analyzed transcript that I kind of will be going through today, a, a bibliography that is publicly editable, so if you have resources you'd like to add to it. The reflection template um, and then the public notes if you feel like taking public notes this is also a publicly editable document okay um, and it might be useful to have the process document as well as the storied document open um, there will be screenshots from the storied document in this presentation <clears throat> okay so i'm going to uh talk just a little bit about narrative inquiry, which is like the overarching um, approach here. So narrative inquiry is um, a research method that is really about uncovering uh, lived experiences. Um, it's about growth. It's about understanding a moment in time. Um, and I feel like it's also something that's constantly shifting. So narratives constantly shift, right? The conversation I have today with you might be different than the one I have with you tomorrow or the one that I had yesterday. Um, and the, the research questions that we use in narrative inquiry uh, are more exploratory and broader than um, one might think of uh, particularly a quantitative study, right? We're not counting something. Um, so for example, in my research for the, for the book that was published this summer, it was, what are the experiences of LIS folks with peer review? It was very broad, very broad. Um, and that continues to be a question that I, I still find very intriguing. Um, so from narrative inquiry, um, under the narrative inquiry umbrella is narrative analysis. And um, this uh, professor psychologist, Polkinghorne, I believe it was in the 70s, uh, kind of distinguished between um, what, uh, what narrative analysis is. And um, I, I go in this a little bit more in depth in the presentation that I gave in February. So you might consider going to watch that or even find, just look at the slides. There's some slides there. Um, so instead of finding themes in what someone's talking about, you take their uh, story and um, use it to make a narrative. So you're going from narrative to narrative <laughs> and kind of uncovering truths and meaning and sense making, doing some sense making um, there. So that's that's kind of the difference. And then, um, and that's just kind of a framing of my approach. And then we have uh, storing stories, which is what we're talking about today. And storing stories was developed by an Australian researcher, Coralie McCormack, for their uh, dissertation. And it, um, there are three citations in the speaker notes for the slides, but they're also listed on the Storing Stories um, process document and on the bibliography as well. Um, <clears throat> that kind of outline this process. And so it is a very interdisciplinary approach to um, interviews and that the analysis of interviews. So it takes from sociolinguistics, critical theory, feminist theory, postmodernist theory. Um, uh, it's the questions are multiple and layered. Um, and uh, the other thing that I'll say about it is that it's iterative. Um, it's very collaborative with, with the folks that you're researching with the interviewee. Um, and it, it will also incorporate your own reflections and your own um, intellectual labor while, um, while you're creating a narrative or coming to that denouement, like um, Polkinghorne was was mentioning. Um, okay. 
So the final product of, of what um, comes out, the I don't want to say the final product, right? There's so many products that are ephemeral, but also like not uh, not physical products. Um, is is a narrative, right? So it's it's an interpretive narrative. So that's the the storied story. Um, and there's three parts to the story. There is the orientation, which um, pulls from uh, particularly the reflection template, which is linked in the resources. Um, folder, but the reflection template um, will ask you as a researcher to kind of position yourself with the person that you're interviewing and, and um, interacting with. Um, and then the stories, which is like the story middle. So the stories that are told or the stories that are uncovered. And then the coda, which is like um, moving forward from that experience or that conversation or from that narrative. And I will say that this is a a Western approach uh, to the way um, a narrative and story are constructed. So what does that actually look like? Um, I, here's just some screenshots. In my book, um, there is one chapter that is uh, simply presents the entire the entirety of an interpretive narrative. And it was the conversation that I had with Stuart Lawson. Um, and Stuart was just so, so kind enough to um, allow me to share the entirety of their interpretive narrative in, in that book. And I'm very grateful to them for that. Um, so you'll see that it's in the book, it's um, with, with text and formatting, it starts with an orientation. And this is not the full length of, of their story, but it's just so you can kind of get how it looks. Then our conversation, um, and you'll notice that the courier font, which is the first paragraph under our conversation, um, is those are my words. Um, and then when you see the Times New Roman, that's uh, Stuart's story. And then um, you'll also notice that there's, oh, sorry, my cat wants to eat the plants. Go away, sorry. <laughs> um, so then there is this intellectual response. So that's part of, uh, in the analysis process, something that I wrote where I was really thinking, um, through some of the things we were talking about together. Um, and so you can kind of see under my intellectual response, I was able to incorporate Stuart's response to my intellectual response in their interpretive narrative. <clears throat> and then finally it ends with a coda, um, short, sweet, but definitely thinking forward. Okay, so that's kind of the structure. So I'd like to move on to um, the first step in storing stories, obviously, is the interview and recording. And now this is the analysis process. So um, if you have in the, um, the, the transcript analysis processes in the resources, but I would like to listen to the entirety of this um, interview clip that Terry Gross did with Questlove. Um, does anyone not know Questlove? Actually, I shouldn't, I shouldn't make you confess to that. Questlove, I love Questlove. And also I am a huge Terry Gross fan. I think Terry Gross is a, an incredibly talented interviewer and um, curious human being. I'm fascinated by her <laughs> life <laughs> and her work. Um, and Questlove is just, uh, just a gem, a, a gem of, of music, of, of culture. Um, so I was trying to find an example of, of an interview to do this. So let's um, listen to this five minutes. But as I'm listening to these five minutes, if you had the opportunity to go through these materials and kind of think about some of these questions that are bulleted on this screen, please put your answers in the chat while we're doing it. So who are the characters? Who are the main events? When do they occur? And then your positioning. Um, how might what you could pretend you were Terry Gross or what reactions or what in emotional or intellectual reactions you're having to this like five minutes. Okay. So I'm going to try and get my mouse over there <laughs> to press play. Your, your new book is a year by year history of songs that have special significance for you since your year of birth in 1971. For 1988, 
You write about Public Enemy's album, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, which is a pivotal yeah. record for a lot of people. I think it was maybe especially pivotal for you, both in terms of like music, but also changing the course of your life. Um, yeah. You were working at a, a 50s-themed fast food place in Philly? Big Al's. Where was um, that? It was on uh, Penn's campus on 34th of Walnut. Um, all I can simply say is that I think every teenager has that one moment in his life or her life or their life in which the possibilities of what life has to offer is shown to you and it's up to you to accept that mission or to ignore that mission. Well, how and did that music, how did that album tell you that you, you need, needed to change the direction of your life and quit your job at Big Al's? Okay, so what makes Public Enemy um, one of the most important artists ever is the fact that in one fell, in one fell swoop, they literally made my dad's entire record collection cool because their uh, pop art, Jackson Pollock me method of, of just throwing paint on the wall and, and watching these colors blend in with each other. That's how they treated records. So I'm listening to their music and it's like, wait a minute, that's David Bowie. Wait a minute, that's George Clinton. That's James Brown. That's the Commodores. That's the Barcase. Like, I'm... You know, I listened to it one down to see, like, how many sound bites could I recognize from my dad's record collection. And once I went over 100, I was like, wait a minute. This is my dad's record collection in one record. It's like a catalog. I can do this. But it was done in a way in which it just didn't sound like... It wasn't like they were mirroring back my, my dad's record collection. It was like they... They filtered it and made it sound urgent. And it was like hearing, I could imagine it was like what it was like to hear the Sex Pistols or Bad Brains uh, or punk music for the first time. Like I had that for me. And when I got to work, I couldn't stop thinking about that record. And when I went on my lunch break, I never went back. I just sat in the park and listened to that record for four hours. And I said to myself, this is what I want to do with my life. Like, I want to make a kid quit his job and change his life direction. This is what I want to do. Like, not just like make music or get a record deal. Like, the way that music made me do those things, this is when I said, this is, this is my direction. Well, you, you, were already, you were already playing with the roots, right? Um, we were a year into it, but, you know, I mean, to be honest with you, I, you know, the roots kind of started with a lie. Like I was just trying to impress a girl that I liked in high school and I was just thinking off the top of my head, and, uh, yeah, I got a group with that guy. And, you know, I ran up to Tariq like, yo, we got a group in case uh, blah, 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 I ask you, all right? <laughs> and Tariq was like baffled, like, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got a group. And then that's kind of how it was. Like, we just freestyle at lunch period. Like, we did one talent show, and Boys to Men got all the attention and all the girls crying in the audience and all those things. And, you know, so I, I didn't truly expect. Like, I was going to follow my father's dream. My father wanted me to go to Curtis Music Institute. He, he, in his mind, like, going to classical, the classical route and making... You know, you could make a hundred thousand dollars a year playing classical music. You know, that was like respectable, um, which is why uh, people always ask me, "Is it true you really didn't tell your dad about the roots until the second album?" And it's like, yeah, because you know, this is you defying your parents, defying de defying your your father. My mother hates when I tell that story because she doesn't want the world to think that she didn't encourage me. She did encourage me, but you know to tell your dad you're not going to go to Juilliard and you're going to get a record deal uh, with your high school friend. Like, that, that's, that isn't the reason why he, like, you know, uh, busted his behind to put you in, in, in the best schools to, you know, to quit to do rap music, end quote. So, 
but yeah, I heard that record and it, it just absolutely, that was my Moses come to the mountain moment in my life. So which track from It Takes a Nation of Millions best illustrates your father's record collection? Uh, his absolute disdain for the track Rebel Without a Pause. He thought it was a tea kettle going off and just thought it was absolute noise. And, you know, little did he know that was just his beloved James Brown loop uh, or being repetitive. And, you know, he couldn't argue with me there. Okay, so let's hear it. Are you all more in love with Questlove and Terry Gross now? <laughs> so I totally am. I just love um, seeing what's happening um, in the chat. Uh, so what I find fascinating about this is that I'm seeing some people talk about who they think that the main characters are, and we're seeing the city of Philadelphia, uh, Questlove's um, mother, father, his friend Tariq. Uh, I didn't, I didn't see in the chat, but Tariq is Tariq is in there. The Roots, right? Um, the group, The Roots, um, the city of Philly. Uh, so you know, you can interpret in many different ways. Um, <clears throat> and um, and then when you think about the main events, right? That was a five five and a half minute clip and the main events as I have them written down are Questlove hears public enemy goes to work takes his lunch break and never goes back sits on a park bench and listens to public enemy for four hours it happens in, in high school in the late 80s um and I think that uh the questions in terms of how you're positioned to the to the participant I saw somebody talking about like um, being from Philly and so really connecting to the the place, the geography that Questlove is talking about. There are people here whose parents have been largely influential with their love of music and how they understand music. And that can be an intellectual, emotional response. Um, and so the, the way that you're positioned and the answers to these questions, or even how you see who the main characters are, because I think I noticed someone say the main care, a main character might be an emotion or a feeling, um, depend on your lived experience and how you interpret the world. And so when you're creating a, um, an interpretive narrative, the interpretive narrative that you create for this interview clip will be different than anyone else's interpretive narrative. So I just want to say that. So I don't feel like I'm an expert here. I'm just sharing with you how I would approach it, given that worldview and that positionality that I shared with you right at the beginning. Um, maybe, uh, and it's possible, maybe you cannot stand rap music, right? <laughs> maybe you had a, have had a bad experience with public enemy, right? So it's possible that those things kind of, kind of come in. So we want to be respectful of them. So um, for the question, how am I positioned during the conversation, I really want to point out, um, this is where your reflection template comes in after an interview. Um, my practice has always been before an interview, sit down with a reflection template and I ask all of these questions of myself. How am I positioned to this person? How do I know them? What is my history with them? Um, and then I answer those questions again at the end. And then I continue to re, uh, reflect on those questions during the whole analysis process. <clears throat> okay, so let's move on to the next step within the, in the storing stories. This is where you locate narrative processes. And this is a, a Western approach um, to what narrative processes look like. So something to be, to be aware of. So I, what I did was I distilled what I saw as the narrative processes. And the, there are um, five narrative processes in the, in the method of storing stories. You have your orientation, you have an evaluation, you have events, and then what happens, an abstract, and then a coda, right? And on the um, transcript process document, there's more information about each of these uh, particular aspects of what a story is. But you go through when you no locate what it is. So this, what's on this screen was the first step of what I noticed. Um, and it's not the entirety of thinking about the roots and um, his father and things like that. It's really about events and what is the setting we're in Philly. We're at, a, at Big L's, 34th and Walnut. 
Um, an evaluation is uh, why the story was told. <clears throat> uh, and then what happened to the events? Questlove went to work, thinking about the record, went on lunch break, never went back, right? Abstract is um, what becomes the title, right, of the story. So this is the title to this particular narrative, um, interpretive narrative. And then the coda is like moving forward. So let me show you. So, th so that's kind of what I did. And I usually do that just kind of like with um, uh, parentheses or brackets in, in the physical document, um, which you can see, I wanna go to here. Um, so the boundaries of a story. So I started the story here, right? And then um, with the, the, the color coding is how I was doing it on the document. So um, next you go on to identify the textual parts, right? So you have on that document, the coding key, you know, the, what is the orientation, abstract summary, et cetera. And so this is kind of what it looked like for me. You'll notice that the events are kind of in that like darker blue. And then um, the textual parts are like theorizing, which is reflection. Augmentation is like, oh, I'm adding to the main story. So here's kind of part of the story that doesn't necessarily comprise. I went to work, I listened to Public Enemy and I never went back. Um, so it's kind of augmenting the story. Argumentation is like making a case for something and the description. So you'll notice um, here, like the light green is theorizing or like this kind of reflection. So this is where Questlove's talking about public enemy and reflecting on public enemy. And then the light blue is like the augmentation, like adding these other players. Um, and then the orange, like the light orange is the argumentation, right? And so this is where you see Questlove talking about the narrative of like um, why his life went the way it did instead of going to a music school, <laughs> which I think is interesting. So after you've done this part, then um, you return the transcript to the participant. And you could certainly put in your intellectual responses as well, right? So you could put some of those intellectual responses, how you're positioned, that positionality can also be in the document on comments or whatever. I um, mean, you ask these questions and these questions are come, come directly from Corley McCormack's method. So I did not write these questions. It could be that you ask different questions. Um, in fact, in, in, my, in my book project, I had one of the participants come back to me and say like, this is a really weird question to be asking me right now. <laughs> like it doesn't make sense for what we did. So um, you could kind of kind of think, think through these. Um, <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> <clears throat> but when when people write back, like this can often, as I as I showed with Stuart's um, story, what they respond to you can actually become part of their interpretive narrative, which is makes it a very rich and kind of robust experience. So after you get those responses, the next thing that you do is um, forming the first draft, and this is where it's. Uh, at least for me, when I discovered this method, kind of mind blowing and my face kind of felt like this, like icon or emoji here. Um, because you're, you, what you do is you take a transcript and you actually like cut and paste. So like the way that it was told to you is not the way that it gets structured in the end. And this is where the Western approach to how someone tells a story kind of gets, um, added on to the interpretive narrative where stories have a beginning, a middle and an end. And when someone tells you about events, they might jump around, right? So Questlove was talking about these, like some of these like amorphous, so not amorphous, some of these experiences, but kind of bouncing back and forth. And so when you interview someone, they might talk about one experience in the first 30 minutes and then there's a 15 minute break. And then later on, they talk about that experience again. So it makes sense to kind of, um, cut and paste stories temporarily. And that's what this method is asking us to do. And I can imagine where that might feel very uncomfortable. You're taking someone's experience as they expressed it to you orally um, or even in writing and you're changing it, you're modifying it. Um, and, and, and I think in this, we do need to reflect on colonization, culture um, and story structures. And what does that mean? Um, how could I be colonizing this work? 
um, by putting that story structure on it. But it does require us to be vulnerable and to breathe through it. And then the other thing to save like so many versions, like just every day between every step, halfway between every step, just save lots and lots and lots. And then as a reminder, you have command X and command V or command Z if you're on a, you know, if you're on a Mac. So copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, cut and paste. It's going to be okay. Um, so <clears throat> in the chat, if you could reflect just for a few moments, um, do you have discomfort with this, the idea of chopping up a, a transcript like this and why? And if you don't, why? Or what is coming up for you with this idea of cutting and pasting? Oh, I'm glad that I see someone likes it. I'm seeing that uh, it's, while some people are comfortable with it, some people aren't comfortable. And the reason is that imposing yourself, right? Interpreting someone else's story and imposing your own narrative on it, um, losing context, things like that. Are you changing the meaning, et cetera? Yeah, so yes, all of the above. So. But there's another step after you do this. There is another step where you send what you've done back to the participant. <clears throat> and they could say, no, this is not how it happened at all. Or they can say, oh, yeah, totally. That makes sense. Or it's anything in between. So this is not the end all be all. Your participant will and should see this story again and the interpretive narrative. And there might even be more content or more discussion that you have with that person, that collaboration that can also get then incorporated into the final <laughs> interpretive narrative. So that conversation is there. Okay, so let me show you how I did this um, with Questlove's little five minute clip. Um, I reordered, so I gave it a, a, the title the title is that was my Moses, Moses come to the mountain moment in my life, which that's, I love that title. It's a very compelling title. And it's, it's why this story was told. That was how Questlove saw it, but maybe you found a different title, right? Maybe your coding was different. Um, but what I did here was I took some of the um, stuff about the roots and I put it first um, to kind of contextualize where quest love was um, in his life. You know, he's talking about, about the roots and like, oh, it was just to impress a girl. And like, kind of like I was into rap music and you know, I worked at this place and then, you know, <clears throat> uh, went on from there. Um, so I reordered it in, in that way. Um, and then uh, I feel like there might be some other, like, I think, so the first part, and then after the events of the story, which are in the darker blue, and then you have some of the, aug, um, the, the um, is that augmentation, I forget, or theorizing, and then you go back um, to like the public enemy and that kind of um, theorizing there. So that's how I did it. And like I said, not everyone's going to do it the same way. <clears throat> so, and then after you're, after you like create that first draft, what you need to start doing is to view the transcript and also the audio um, from um, uh, go through the audio and, and view through language and context. And I just really want to um, look at this. Uh, Stephanie asked a question. Um, can you cut anything like the questions? Yes, absolutely. And in my um, working with transcripts, 
uh, in interviews, because it's a conversation you're having with someone, when you start cutting your questions out, and if you can provide context for them in another way, um, that is one way to decenter yourself from sharing that person's interpretive narrative. <clears throat> um, okay, so viewing through language and context. So you have to reflect on what is said, how it is said, and what is unsaid. And so this is where we have, um, you need to be using the audio and the, and the transcript as well, kind of at the same time. I listened to interviews over and over and over again while looking at the, the transcript. So it's important to, to sign, because you're listening to it and asking yourself these questions, um, you have the document that's ordered temporary, like temporarily, but then to have a copy of it also that's like unaltered so that you can listen to it and reflect on these questions. Um, <clears throat> so, and again, like what is said, how it is said, and what is unsaid is also coming straight from McCormick. So um, what is unsaid could can, comes back to some of these linguistic things, right? Like the speed of delivery, silences, inflections, volume, internal dialogue, um, and then how it is said, like that's um, also kind of linguistics, like what kind of pronouns are being used, um, metaphors, imagery, voice, <clears throat> and all of, the, all of those things. And then what is said, and a lot of that, that can come um, to questions of resistance, like you might, might find in critical theory. Um, how do I relate to society? How am I challenging society, um, et cetera. And then there's um, viewing through situation and culture <clears throat> uh, as well. So that's after <laughs> how it is said, how it is unsaid. Then you view through more context, the cont situation context, and then also the cultural context. So what are the <clears throat> situational context could be about like the actual interview. What are the power dynamics between the interviewer and the interviewee? Are you sitting in a room that's really noisy? Are you sitting over Zoom and Emily's cat is trying to eat the plants and she's disturbed by having to, you know, spray the cat? Um, uh, other kind of um, situational things that might happen, like inflections, bodily movements, um, and then the culture, the context of the culture, right? Like what's happening in the world? What are the cultural fictions or expectations? Um, how are constructions of self happening? Okay. So I wanted to show what this looks like on the document, viewing through um, language and context. For me, I've always kind of done it in uh, comments on a document. So you'll notice, like I point out, this isn't internal monologue, or I'll point out, um, you know, there is this one word that th that Questlove used, used um, the word literally. So, you know, <laughs> what does that mean? And I'm sure there's plenty of linguistic research on the use of the word literally. Um, uh, the tone of voice, right? Voice ranges. Um, and then also with transcription, um, false starts. A lot of times false starts just get deleted, but I find that sometimes there, there might be meaning to think about in those false starts. So here's another screenshot. Um, of viewing through like uh, the situ the cultural, particularly um, the narrative of what it means to be successful in the music industry, right? Like that's like a cultural fiction. And how does how does Questlove resist that cultural fiction um, by doing that? And then uh, the cultural fiction of a father son relationship, perhaps. What is is it a cultural fiction that music can change your life? You know what what does the meaning meaning have have here? So there are, in this five minute clip, there's a lot of rich uh, thinking to be done. So let's listen. Um, I have three some three uh, three really short clips that we can kind of think about, and I'd love for you all in the chat. Um, we'll go one by one to to say what um, you think like what what's happening there in terms of what is said and what is unsaid and even even context so let's go with the um first one um all i can simply say is that i think every teenager has that one moment in his life or her life or their life in which the possibilities of what life has to offer is shown to you and it's up to you to accept that mission or to ignore that mission. Okay. 
How do you interpret that? What is said and what is unsaid? I also noticed the pronoun use um, when I first heard this interview. I actually heard this interview on the radio and then went back to it. Um, what does it say about, about teenage, teenagehood, being a teenager? Yep. Mm -hmm. Every teenager, right? Universality. Yep. 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 What's unsaid? Oh, I love it. Okay. I can't keep up anymore. This is great. Oh, seeing teenagers as humans. Yeah. Maybe. There's, there are approaches that don't see that. <laughs> Manifest testing. Yeah, interesting. Okay, let's move on to the um, next clip. Another 20, 20 some on second clip. Yeah, I, I agree, Catherine. I don't, I don't know. Okay, let's move on to this one. And this is about um, cultural fiction. Four hours. And I said to myself, this is what I want to do with my life. Like, I want to make a kid quit his job and change his life direction. This is what I want to do. Like, not just like make music or get a record deal. Like, the way that music made me do those things. This is when I said, this is, this is my direction. Any responses on that one? For me, this one is about cultural fiction. Having impact on people, the artist's calling, transcendence. Mm -hmm. Oh, deciding what to do with your life. Is anyone here not decided yet? <laughs> How to create music that you can feel. Uh-huh. Yep. And just because we're calling it a cultural fiction doesn't mean we can't experience it, right? Like, I think that word fiction is a little bit of a misnomer. <clears throat> Finding a mission. Yep. Finding a mission or purpose is, uh, uh, as one of my yoga teachers calls it, it's finding your dharma. Are you working towards your dharma? Life-changing music, not just about commercial success, correct? Yep, no, that's, is it a fiction or a reality, right? Maybe it's both. Yep. Oh, I love seeing some of the things that are coming up in chat because they're things I hadn't thought of. That's what I love so much about this method. We're all bringing ourselves to it in a different way. So the last clip that I want to share here um, has a lot of this internal dialogue where you can hear some of the voice inflection. Um, and so what's interesting is how to represent that in text, um, which can be interesting to kind of think through how do you represent someone's internal dialogue when you're interpreting their words or creating an interpretive narrative. So let's listen to this 30 seconds. Oops. So I'm listening to their music and it's like, wait a minute, that's David Bowie. Wait a minute, that's George Clinton. That's James Brown. That's the Commodores. That's the Barcase. Like I'm um, you know, I listened to it one down to see like how many sound bites could I recognize from my dad's record collection. And once I went over a hundred, I was like, wait a minute, this is my dad's record collection in one record. It's like a catalog. I can do this. <laughs> so 
So how would you interpret that internal dialogue that Questlove is expressing with the higher pitch? An awaking discovery. It was there the whole time. Oh, I like this, the um, internal conversation with your younger self. Mm -hmm. Joy, right? You don't know what he means by I can do this. Okay, and I think that is um, because of the, the clip um, was shortened. excitement, a sense of pride. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting here is like in your interpretive narrative, as you're, as you're reacting and you're writing um, and you're expressing this and you say something about somebody, uh, about something that they said, you could say, it sounds like they're um, excited and sharing a sense of pride. And that participant in reading could be like, actually, I meant it this way. That is not my experience. Right. So there is that opportunity coming up again um, and how we understand what we're hearing and what happened in that conversation. Okay, let's go on to completing the story. So this is where um, you get your voice incorporated the feedback from the participant incorporated your emotional responses, your relational responses, um, you're reflecting on context and language. Um, you get more feedback from the interviewee and that gets incorporated again. Um, and the reflection template uh, is really important in, in this section as well, right? Because that reflection template is something that you are, it's pretty much a template for journaling. The whole time that you're doing this, you should be reflecting and thinking um, both on this, on the analysis documents, but also on that reflection template. Um, <clears throat> so you could think of things like, I don't know, with Questlove, you could say, oh, I was working on this, but I had just seen the movie uh, Summer of Soul, which if you don't know, Questlove produced, it came out this, this summer. Um, it was one of my first, um, pandemic going to the movie theater experiences was lovely. Um, or, hey, Public Enemy was playing on the radio and it made me think of this. So anything in your life, but then also thinking about like, is it true that Questlove is rejecting um, a cultural narrative? Why am I calling this a cultural fiction? You know, what is those kinds of things you can start, start thinking about? And yes, that movie is also on Hulu. Um, Okay, so what does uh, an interpretive narrative look like? I showed you a little bit for um, Stuart's story, but on the storied uh, document, one that I did for this five minute clip is there. It was, it's very cursory. It's, I would say it's not complete, um, even though I'm calling it the final story, because there's so much richness just in these five minutes um, that, you know, just go easy on me. <laughs> So I, you know, this is, <clears throat> this is what it looked like. You'll notice. Um, so somebody was asking earlier, earlier about like, can you delete like what the interviews asking interviewers asking, and you'll notice in this, there's only like Terry Gross's voice, you know, only comes in twice. Right. Um, and at the orientation, you know, is, is the spot where you say, like, if you don't know about this person, like this is who this person is pop culture figure, drummer, hip hop group author, movie producer. Um, and then for me, you know, I was reflecting as if I were actually interviewing a quest love, like, uh, there was an album, um, things fall apart was an album that I was listening to at a particular time in my life, uh, the roots music. Um, and I kind of like talk about that. Um, and just kind of like a brief things that stick out. And then, um, you'll see like some of the indentation and then some of my thinking here, like, um, you know, some of those questions I had about like, uh, particularly where he's talking about public enemy finding him himself in relation to like punk rock, what may have happened like in the sixties or seventies. So the people, maybe a generation before him or uh, some of his elders, and then like, you know, kind of like, 
putting in that frame what what is being unsaid about being a black kid in philly um can we even interpret that right that's something that you'd go back and forth with the interviewee um about so that's kind of what that looks like so um okay final thoughts here are my final thoughts um things we should always be reflecting on how is my analysis a practice of the dominant paradigm? And by that, I mean, am I colonizing someone else's story? Which was the fear that I saw a lot of you expressing in terms of like cutting and pasting. Um, like I said, save versions of your work, like so many versions, <laughs> so many versions. Um, journal daily. And then, and then um, finally, like you're not doing it wrong and you're not doing it right. You're just doing it. Um, you're doing it in a time and place and context. Uh, finding one truth is not the goal here. Meaning is meaningless. There are many truths. There are um, different truths from day to day. And I think that this storing stories is about the process and the practice um, of really, really diving in. Um, <clears throat> and with that, we have a good half hour for discussion and questions, which is even more than I had hoped. And we have lots of questions that have been coming into the Q&A um, and a few that came in through the chat. So um, for those of you who put your question, oh yes, applause. <laughs> Thank you, Elsa. I'm like jumping right to questions because there's going to be also lots of time for um, applause, but I love the applause coming in. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to reassure the people who have put their questions into the chat that Marie and I have been kind of uh, trying to keep track of those um, and we'll we'll try to ask those as well. But um, can we jump right in and start with some of the questions that have been coming in right from even like for 20, 30, 40 minutes ago? Um, so the first one from Stacy, um, Emily, is uh, how does it work with the IRB to share the person's story and identity? Uh, that was a question I had as well, and I'm sure that um, Stacy and I weren't the only ones. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I love IRB processes, and I hate them at the same time. I think that um, this is like a perennial question for qualitative research. Um, for my book. Uh, Stuart was the only one who was willing to share their entire interpretive narrative. Stuart was the only one comfortable using their real name. So everyone else in my book, it's an, uh, um, a pseudonym um, that's being used. And uh, participants, at least for that project, had the opportunity to eliminate parts of their story or even give some creative <laughs> input as to how the ideas might be represented that would not make them personally identifiable. Um, so that was... <clears throat> That was a practice that I used, and I did go through an IRB process for the work of that book. Um, however, when it comes to the rest of my work and the project Stories of Open, which is at storiesofopen.org, <laughs> where I've been continuing to interview people, but those interviews are not getting storied. They're pretty much just cleaned up interview transcripts. Um, those people, it's like working as a journalist. So I'm not, I didn't even go through an IRB process for that because it was understood from the get-go that people were just being interviewed and it was getting put up on a website. Um, and I, I really struggle with IRB um, because partially, it could partially be gatekeeping, right? And it is a, a, a research practice coming from our institutions. Um, so I, 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 I struggle, I struggle with it because it could be, um, right. You have to go to a board for approval for your research and like, what is the, what's the bias of that board and, and, um, you know, whose research is valid and what methods are valid. You know, there was a whole, whole thing to enter in there. Um, <clears throat> but that, yes, there are ways to kind of do it. And then there are, what can be frustrating about that is that there are certain stories that cannot be shared. If someone shares something with you in the interview process and it's just not okay, then okay, so you've learned and the participant learned and you thought about it and the rest of the world doesn't get to get to read it or hear it, but that's okay, right? We have a long history of traditional cultural expression that should not be shared and that's okay. 
great. Lot, lots of questions coming in, so I'm going to keep them keep them coming at you. So another question here that came in into the chat from Lisa. Um, do you think there are power structures between the interviewer and the researcher, uh, the interviewer researcher rather, and the subject that might prevent um, the subject um, from honestly reviewing the interpretation? That question came in when we were talking about at that at that point in the process. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, um, and I think that's also where doing the daily journaling practice um, can really help. Um, I would also say that this method maybe isn't appropriate for everything that you're trying to do. Um, so there is that as well. There might be other ways or sometimes maybe someone just, it's a story that doesn't need to be shared. Another question about participants. Um, actually, I'm not even sure if I'm using the right word, subjects, participants. Anyways, you can comment on that. Um, from Madeline, what does this look like if interviewing a non-English speaking interviewee? I don't, I don't have experience with that. Okay. Okay. Madeline sounds like that's something you might want to explore. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to pop, the, those are some of the questions that came in for, through the chat. I'm going to come over to the Q&A. So a question from Carly. Emily, I think you maybe can see these ones too, but I'll read it out for the recording. Um, so from Carly, I had a similar question to Stacy. Is there a way to use this approach while protecting the person's identity? I worry about this, especially knowing that the details of a person's story can point to their identity, even if their name is kept confidential. You might have answered that a bit, but is there anything else? Um, I will say that for some people, it is a great privilege and exercise and power to even participate in an interview. Another question from Nanette. Uh, Nanette's question was in reference to, you used the term cultural fiction. Nanette says, I was going to ask you about the cultural fiction. Maybe I missed it. Why are you calling his truth? Uh, Questlove's Truths, uh, cultural fiction. Right. And I think um, the cultural fiction comes from the uh, method and, and McCormack's work. And there's probably a citation in there that I can't recall right now. Um, think of it as it could, you could think of it as like a trope, right? Like a trope or a common narrative of a um, person's father wants them to be successful and go to business school person decides to be an artist that's a I don't know western trope is that making sense I hope that's making sense um <clears throat> the, uh, there could be a cultural could be cultural fiction of uh women are demure or women are always defined by the males in their lives um could be something like that um I hope this is making sense. I feel like I'm flailing a little bit, but I think that it can kind of talk about that in the, if you go back to the article, it is coming from some of the, the theory. And yes, I'm seeing something in the chat that, that makes a lot of sense to me. So thank you for contributing that, Amanda, the common narrative, familiar framework. Um, so it's like a cultural framework or a master narrative. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, that was really helpful. Thank you for that chat contribution. Both of you are very helpful. <laughs> Um, Jamie wants, I'll go back to some of the questions that came in through in the chat earlier, but um, Jamie has a question. Can you talk about the opportunities and challenges in doing this kind of work as a research team rather than as an individual? Great question. Well, I don't have experience doing this as a team, so I can't really, I can only like share with you assumptions that I might have. Um, and McCormick did not do this as a team. The only team that existed was the researcher and the collaborator or the inner person whose story was being shared. So that is a collaboration. Um, so that would be something to think through, Jamie. And I really, I, I haven't even thought of that. Yeah, it strikes me that the reflection thing, the reflection part would be a, a very much of a group reflection 
Um, and just even how I noticed when people were sharing their thoughts in the chat, how it was bringing it was bringing more new ideas for um, for 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 you about the characters. So I can I can see that being a really interesting situation. Marie, sorry, I think I talked over you. It's fine. I'm just wondering if anyone um, who's here as a participant has done this as a research team. Could you let us know in the chat how that went for you? So we could learn from you. But let's keep moving on. There's so many good questions. Thank you. Okay, I think I missed one. Um, I think Kimberly commented earlier um, in the chat about having completed an auto ethnographic study that used a similar process. Um, Emily, do you consider this in some sense an auto, eth auto ethnography? Oh, so many thoughts. Um, <clears throat> I don't, auto ethnography is definitely under the narrative inquiry umbrella. And there's been some good work in LIS uh, that's done this. And actually, I would love to um, pitch. Uh, I grew up with someone, M. Soledad Caballero, who just won uh, a, a book of poetry and it just won an award for being an autoethnographic work and a work of narrative inquiry. And I'll find that and put that in the, in the chat. Um, I think that the work of the interpretive narrative is, <clears throat> while you can learn a lot about yourself in this process, the aim is to share someone else's story and try and make meaning there with that person. So it's not about you as a researcher. And it is a fine balance between like taking yourself out. And if you go back and read like um, Stuart's story, um, and I should say the book, uh, my book is open access. So like you, you can find it free online. Um, if you go back and read that, like it, even in my reflection, I'm reflecting about how I'm interacting with Stuart. And I'm so excited to talk to them that I interrupt them or I'm inserting too much of myself in that process. And so um, reflecting on how we interact as humans. And then there were concerted attempts that I made in that I have made when I've storied stories to take myself out. Just because it's part of the transcript and things I'm thinking about does not mean that it needs to be part of the final interpretive narrative. And especially if it's something centered around um, the researcher. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'll, I'll head to another question from Stacy. Um, how do you reconcile how the, the interviewee, um, how they may want to be perceived, how that might conflict with how they may have sounded in their response? Again, I think that was a question asked when we were talking about the uh, sent the back and forth between the researcher and the interviewee. Yeah, could I also just point out, Amanda put in a great uh, comment. Amanda, I'm learning from you a lot today. Um, get away from the question, the word truth. So I just wanna highlight, make sure people saw that. It's, it's phenomenology, it's lived experience, right? So that is perhaps a truth, but you don't even have to use the word truth. Great, thank you. I had missed that in the chat too. So, um, all right, a question from Lisa. You mentioned a few times that this is through a Western lens. Is there anything in the resources and bibliography that talks about non-Western lenses or anything you can recommend that's um, not in that list? Um, I would probably go back to um, <clears throat> uh, looking at uh, critical indigenous research methods. I forget the name of that book. But this um, this story structure is a Western story structure. That is the structure that I know. It is the culture in which I live. Um, so I don't know that this method would necessarily be appropriate if you were chatting with folks um, from different cultures and understand narrative in, in, a, in a different way. So again, it's like, is this method appropriate for that? Um, I would go, what is it? What is that? Oh shoot, what is that book called? But so obviously, no, it's not on the bibliography. And that um, 
is an oversight and my sincere apologies. If you have anything, please add it. That's why the bibliography is open. <laughs> um, I think maybe Maxwell just put a title, I think maybe into the chat, perhaps decolonizing methodologies, research in indigenous peoples. Um, okay, another question from Greta. Since you're reordering the narrative as you go, do you ever use a coding software so you can see coded text of one type all, of, all at the same time? Or do you need to see the whole narrative in context as you work? You need to see the narrative in context. I would say that seeing chopped up bits of text or type is not storing stories. I would say it sounds more like grounded theory because this this is where you go back to the to polking horn um this is where you where you go back from like you're 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 not looking for themes that then come to like the truth right this is not a theme that says this is the way it is it is about an experience it is about a narrative it is about a story and so that's where narrative analysis the the purpose of narrative analysis is to take a narrative to understand the narrative and then to offer the narrative. Whereas um, analysis of narrative, which is the what Polkinghorne uses, narrative analysis versus analysis of narrative would be more your grounded theory type thing where you're using Atlas or deduce or something like that. And you're like looking at chunks of text that speak to a specific question. I think this also um, points to what is the research question that I'm asking? So is your research question about the lived experiences of someone with music or is it, um, oh, what? see, I, I have a hard time thinking of something more narrow because I just like, it's, it's so troubling to me. Uh, instead of like uh, something very finely scoped about like what, what happens at this particular journal with, peer review between the years of this and this and yeah and I'm not trying to minimize um, other kinds of research it's just not my approach Emily I'm jumping in with a, a question about the, the quiet parts of an interview so when analyzing interviews uh, most people first transcribe the audio and then work from the text and most people I've talked to in this process remove utterances like, um, well, hmm. So silence is usually not accounted for in a transcript at all because there's literally nothing to transcribe. And I noticed when I read the piece by Coralie McCormick, she includes pauses in her transcripts, noting whether they're short or long. Can you talk about that and what importance quiet or like throwaway utterances have in storying. Yes, <laughs> and it, and I will also say, you know, my experience with storying is I found the method, I read about the method, and I tried it. So I don't want to say that what I'm saying is right, but this is what my experience is and what I have done. And I think back to uh, in my book, there's a. <clears throat> someone I interviewed for that book would pause a lot around certain stories that were, um, uh, and here I'm doing it, where they wanted to make sure they got it right. Like they didn't want to say the wrong thing. Um, but that's also something you can, you can um, go back to someone and say like, like in your, as you're going back and forth with a participant, like in this area, I noticed there's a lot of pauses and it could be that the person is trying to say the right thing or they want to, you know, think before they speak. Um, there was an example of someone using a word and, <clears throat> and it was part of what became um, her story title, but the story title was misleading if it's just in text. So then I realized that couldn't be the story title because she had used this word saying, I thought it was empowering. But instead of her saying, I thought it was very, I thought it was empowering. The is she said, I thought it was, um, I guess, empowering. You know, the voice went up. It was a question mark. You can't really, it kind of neutralizes 
the power of the word empowering, right? When it's stated as a question, because kind of looking for language and, and what's not being said there. It could be that silences, um, maybe this is where you reflect on your positionality and where you reflect on your power dynamic with the interviewee. That could be something that's coming into play. There's so many different things that can be said. Um, sometimes false starts, you know, you just ignore them, but I think that they're important to keep in just when you're listening. So I would listen many, many times and read at the same time. And so I'd be like going through the transcript and listening at the same time and looking for the pauses and looking for what's happening. And then doing it, I think at the beginning of your process and in the middle and at the end, just to make sure you didn't miss anything, right? So it's iterative, like you do have steps, but you can kind of go back and do some of it again. Does that kind of get what you asked, uh, Marie? Okay. Um, if I can jump in, um, one of the things I was wondering about um, were whether or not you have any strategies for what happens when you get stuck, uh, when you're trying to craft the story, like when the story is just not emerging or, um, I don't know, is there a list of questions you ask yourself? Like, obviously you had the questions of who are the characters, the main events, or has that just not, has that just not been, do you just not get stuck? The stories just emerge. I don't think I got stuck. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just with anything else, take a break, you know, put it away for a while. Yeah. And come back to it. What about when you follow up with participant um, and maybe you get that, Yep, it's fine, but like, like not reflection like that, that, because I mean, yeah. this is time consuming, time consuming for the participant as well, right, to engage in this kind of research, I would think. So did you encounter that at all? Sure did. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I have to take their word for what it is. And you can also incorporate that into the interpretive narrative and say, you know, here's so-and-so story, uh, you know, they thought it was fine. Cool. Great. Or maybe like you're, you just, you're, you're great. You got it right. <laughs> and again, like I said, the stories that we're creating here, this is the story that the way I am interpreting things and someone else is going to have a different lens. We've got a question from Chris. How do you think your choice of method influenced the findings that are reported in your book? Did you achieve your goals for the book? Oh, <laughs> um, I mean, are there findings in my book? <laughs> I don't know if there are really findings there. I mean, I guess like, I feel like, Maybe there's some assumptions that I made in the book, but I don't know if they're really findings. Um, did I achieve my goals? Yes. Oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Um, did I achieve my goals? I think what's helping me continue to work on that is my project. I still, I'm still sitting on a lot of interviews that I'm not storing, but I'm just kind of cleaning up and posting on my website um, because for me, the work is not, not ever done. And I think there's also um, what I'm finding with the interviews for my website is that the people who have privilege and who feel safe are able to share their stories. And so I think that's something else when we think about, I mean, because I'm doing this, this research on peer review in library and information science, right? Like it's about our community and people know one another. We're a really small community. Um, so just being cognizant of that. And then I'm trying to, what was the second part? Did I achieve my goals for the book? Um, well, sure. I mean, I don't know. I'd love for open peer review to be the standard practice in LIS, but I think that's a tall order. <laughs> Emily, can you tell us a little bit more about um, the evolution of your own, of, of this kind of research journey for you? How did you get interested in this topic, this, this method? I, uh, yeah, so I, I'm in a position that is a tenure related position and I always felt like there was a 
disconnect between research method and kind of how I move throughout the world. Um, and part of that is not having good research methods training, right? Like there was one class in library school that was like, here's SPSS. Um, <clears throat> not to belittle library school, but, um, you know, we're not well trained to become academics um, for those of us who are. And I grew up in a family of academics, you know, my, <laughs> my uh, um parents are retired professors. My sister has a PhD. She married someone with a PhD. My grandfather had a PhD. I have an, an uncle, you know, like I'm from like this privileged academic family. Um, and so, but I, when I was in this tenure related position, I had to produce. And there was one instance where I was trying to look at this question of peer review, open peer review and LIS. And I did a survey and the reviewers, uh, and it was really like an exploratory survey, but probably also the wrong method for what I was trying to do because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and the reviewers were like, oh, you did a survey. We wanna see percentages and numbers. And I was like, but that's not what it's about. <laughs> that's not what it's about. So, um, but I couldn't do a longitudinal project. I didn't feel like I had a method. I didn't know how to do it, something that would take a lot more time because I was on the tenure clock and I just wanted the job security. And, um, you know, I was living in the city that I wanted to live in. And, you know, everyone wants to live in Portland or everyone wants to live in Portland, um, which is, that's a cultural fiction too, by the way. Um, <laughs> so, uh, after I got tenure, I was looking for something and I was reading, reading through, you know, like trying to find methods. And Bob, I always talk about Bob, Bob Schrader, a former colleague of mine, he's, he retired, um, was at this point discovering autoethnography and was my next door neighbor at work. So our offices, you know, next to each other. And I talked to Bob every day and we talked, we had many office chats about research methods, qualitative methods, um, and just trying to discover this, this method. And when I found it, because I knew what I wanted to do, I knew I wanted to share stories, but I didn't know how I was going to do it. And then when I found this method, it was in the handbook of quality of quality of research methods or something, some sage handbook. Um, and then I found it and I was like, ran into Bob's office with the book. And I was like, Bob, Bob, look. Um, so a long way to say, I have a ton of privilege for being tenured now a ton of privilege that I get a sabbatical. Um, so that's kind of my framing around that. Great, thank you. And I echo, I think, um, the, the appreciation for your honesty <laughs> uh, that we saw in the chat. I think this might be a good time. We're, we're coming up on 4.30 and we wondered if um, we'd like to engage the, continue to engage the audience. I really appreciate the audience that has been um, such amazing participants in this event. Um, one question we have for the audience is if you can imagine where in LIS this method might be beneficial. Are you already starting to think about um, places where you could see using this? Um, Emily in her article mentions that it could be useful in investigations of promotion and tenure, experiences of librarians in community colleges or people in one person shops. Um, so if you have any ideas that you've been that have been percolating about how you might um, make use of this method in your own research, please um, pop those into the chat now. Let's see what everybody has to say. I'm not that interesting. <laughs> so Kelly's contributed um, experience of librarians in professional organizations. Chris said Emily's story. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Cultural histories of the library profession. I should read some of these, right? They might not be in the 
in the, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, Rick has contributed cultural histories of the library profession. Haley's working on a mapping student engagement project and has been thinking about how this method could enhance those stories of undergraduate students about their engagement. BIPOC experiences in library school. Yes. Sorry, I'm a slower reader, I think, than everybody. That's why I, I would probably get stuck in the storying process. It takes me a while to read. Um, engaging students with interviewing community members and donating interviews to the Queen's Memory Project Ar Archival Repository. Thanks, everybody. Did I miss one? I think you got them all. That's okay. great. And Emily, I feel like we could talk to you, um, but our time is, is just about up. So with that, um, we have Emily's contact information. If you would like to be in touch with her about this, uh, we're also available to continue the conversation. We're really hoping to figure out how to apply this method to, to work we're doing. So let us know about your successes or failures as you move through this process, this iterative process. So to, I would like to thank Emily and Catherine for being here. Can we get some applause for them in the chat? And thank you to Loyola Marymount University for its support of the Institute for Research Design and Librarianship. Um, thank you to the Institute of Museum and Library Services for your consistent grant support of IRDL since 2014. Um, thank you to the team that labored to put together this learning event. Please join us on January 12th from 10 to 1130 Pacific Standard Time for the next speaker in our series, Jennifer Esposito. Her talk is titled Intersectional Qualitative Research centering race and gender to conduct humane and ethical research. I'm just gonna pop into the chat the link to the series so everybody can see it and register for the next sessions. And with that, our time is up. Thank you again to Emily and Catherine, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>